Well, good evening, everybody. And uh, before I begin, I want to again remind us all to pray for those who are struggling with this virus right now. And uh, remember Gary Holback, he's in the hospital. And, um, and remember uh, Jerry Hansen still. She's, I believe, still in the hospital. She's supposed to be coming home sometime this week. But um, she'll be dealing with some of the after effects of this of this disease for a little while. So keep her in prayer and others. There are others that are, that are dealing with it right now. And so let's remember one another and thank the Lord for his blessings and pray for his comfort and strength for those that are sick. I'm in Revelation 2.18 this evening. Revelation 2.18 will begin the letter to the church at Thyatira. That'll be the title of the message, the church at Thyatira. And uh, in verse 18, it says, and unto the angel of the church, and remember that's just the messenger of the church, that's the pastor. In Thyatira, write, these things saith the Son of God, who hath eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. And I think we'll just take this a, a verse at a time. Thyatira is mentioned elsewhere in Scripture. You might remember that Lydia, whose heart the Lord opened as Paul preached the gospel to her and her friends in Acts chapter 16, was from Thyatira. And so um, she likely went back to Thyatira. She was on a, a trip in, in uh, Acts 16, it, it says. And she may well have been a member of this church that, uh, that the Lord wrote this letter to. Um, I know this whether she was or not, that the, everybody in the church, the true church at Thyatira, was a group of people whose heart the Lord opened. I know that. Because we can't receive anything except he opened our hearts to receive the word and give faith in Christ. So she may well have been one of them. But it's important to remember, and this letter sort of highlights this. As we go through it, you'll kind of see this that the Lord is speaking to a church here, not individuals. Individuals can be specifically sort of diagnosed as the problems that they have. When he's speaking of a church, this church has problems, but that doesn't mean everybody in the church had that particular problem. He's warning everybody because whatever our individual particular problems are, we're susceptible to all of these. This is a lesson to all of us. And so that's why the, the, it's, I have to keep reminding myself of that. This is to a, a whole church. And there were people that were doing this and that, and there were people, I'm sure, that, were, that didn't have, the, that, that the Lord was including in the commendable parts of the letter that didn't include some. And then when he's warning, he's warning everybody, though, because all of us, while we're in this flesh, there's no sin we can't commit. There's no problem we can't have. So that's, that's what I just wanted to say about that. There were false professors of religion among the people of this church, and we'll see that as we go along. But he's, uh, he speaks also of their, their, the works and love and, and uh, commends them, but these false professors are mentioned, these, these Jezebels. He calls it Jezebel. It could have possibly been one person but I feel like it was a group of people he's just calling Jezebel. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Not everybody, though, just as the commendations in the letter, I'm sure didn't apply to everybody there. There's the church, and then there's kind of people that come to church, and then there's things like that. So, so we understand that. He's writing this to a church, and it's important to remember that. The Lord knew and knows each individual case in every church perfectly. We know that, and he deals with each individual perfectly. He speaks to hearts from his word individually. So he doesn't just talk to speak to churches, but this is a letter to a church. So understand that. These encouragements and warnings and rebukes are for each of us, no matter our individual case, because we're all flesh. All of us are flesh, as well as spirit. And so... When there are commendable things in us, it's his spirit that dwelleth in us. Paul said, not Christ, not I, but Christ. But when it's uh, that which needs to be rebuked and warned of, that's our flesh. But we all need the encouraging words that our Savior 
gives to his churches as well as the warnings. So let's look at it that way. Thyatira was a very idolatrous city, as I suppose all cities are to one degree or another. But, but this place was a place where great pressure to compromise was put upon people. Uh, to compromise with the idolatrous and, and the traditions, the, the evil fleshly traditions of their religion there in that city. If you were going to work and prosper, think about it. Those who are in power, if they're that way and they pressure people to compromise, what are you going to do? Just quit your job? You don't have a living? Or are you going to compromise? Are you going to go along with the evil and the idolatrous religion? And this was a problem for this church. And I know of individual experiences now, right now, in my experience with, with people that I know of believers like this, where they're, where they're uh, pressured to, to compromise with things and, and to, 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 to do things they don't want to do because of the pressure that this world and how evil and religiously evil this world is and the pressure that our whole world is becoming more and more insistent that we tolerate its evil. I'm sure some of you have noticed that. That's not going to get any better in this country. People aren't happy just being evil. They want you to condone it. And they'll force you to condone it. And that was some pressure that was happening here in this church. Now remember also that these letters are written first to the angels or messengers of the churches, the pastor, because it's the business of the pastor particularly to watch over and to guard to preach the truth of Christ, to be consistent and faithful, to preach the truth of Christ, which is the only way to protect the church against error. You don't protect against error by pointing out error. We may do that, but you protect, to get, protect against error by proclaiming the truth. You, you, if you got a crooked stick and you, you're like, is that stick crooked? Put a straight one down there next to it and you'll know if it's crooked or not. And that's how we defend against the error. God's spokesmen are compared in the scriptures to watchmen on a wall, on the wall of a castle, keeping watch out for dangers constantly. The dangers are false Christs being preached and false teachings, uh, uh, perversions of the gospel and anything contrary to the truth of God, which the Lord has taught us. We cannot and must not tolerate anybody who teaches anything false or openly opposes that which is God's truth. Now listen to me. There may be people that come in here that don't believe what we believe. If they're willing to sit down and listen to the gospel, welcome. Come on in. But if somebody comes in here proudly and boldly and openly opposing the gospel, it's my job primarily to watch over the church, but I want all of you involved in not tolerating that. They need to be as unwelcome as possible. That's just not, a, we can't tolerate it. Again, they may come in with all kinds of false ideas about God. They might be total heretic. Sit down and hear the gospel and you're welcome here. But we can't tolerate open rebellion and, and, and um, opposition to, to God's truth, to the, to the gospel of Christ. And that's all of us now. Anybody who teaches anything. Listen, Paul said, but though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached. And it's on record, isn't it? We know what he preached. Let him be accursed. And so that's what we need to understand here. And, and I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. I understand that. But I want to kind of introduce this letter thoroughly. And then we'll kind of see what I mean by this tolerating of the evil. As we go through this, we watch over God's church also by faithfully proclaiming the word. We're not going to tolerate anybody that comes in and causes division and, and that perverts the gospel openly and, and proudly. But also by just simply, as I said, proclaiming the truth of God concerning his sovereign power and love and salvation by Christ. People need to know how sinners are saved. And there's no compromise on that. It's by grace through faith in the Son of God who is our righteousness and our sin offering. All of the gospel, as Paul said in Acts 20, 27, listen, here's what we've got to, here's how you stand on the wall and, and watch and be faithful in that. 
He said, I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. That's how you protect against error right there too. The whole counsel of God concerns his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and how that sinners are saved by him, by him being their righteousness. He doesn't just provide righteousness. He is our righteousness. And by him being our effectual sin offering, not him, not his blood being an offer to men, but an offering unto God for the sins of his people. Now that's, that's our gospel and we don't shun to declare all of it by God's grace. So the Lord identifies himself in this letter as the son of God, whose eyes are as a flame of fire and his feet are like fine brows. Brass. Now this identifies him as the one not to be trifled with. If somebody's eyes are flames of fire and their feet are fine breath, don't play around with them. Don't trifle with them. This is Listen to Paul's description of the Savior in Romans 1.3. Concerning his son, he's just talking about the gospel in Romans 1, uh, 1 and 2. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power. Not just declared to be the Son of God, but declared to be the Son of God with power. That name, the Son of God, it brings to me, he's God in human flesh. He's a man that does as he pleases. He's a man that runs this universe. Christ here is declaring his majesty and exerting his infinite authority when he says, I, this is the Son of God speaking to you. He's reminding us that he's to be had in reverence by all those that are about him. But also, this is comforting to God's sheep. This is the Son of God writing a letter to you saying, here's what I see in you. I see good works in you. But here's some warnings. He's guiding them. He don't write letters to his enemy. He don't write letters to people he's going to put in hell. This is comforting. We fear him but we're not afraid of him. If you're a believer, that makes sense to you. That's not a contradiction. We're, we fear him, but we're not scared of him. We understand that now, but, but what also a comfort, we serve, we serve the son of God. We serve God's son. As we angels of the churches are watching over his flock, he's watching over all of us. He's the son of God. And that's a comfort, isn't it? He's the one who asked those Roman soldiers in the garden. This is the one that loves you with an everlasting love and watches over you. Think about this. This is the one when those soldiers came in the garden of Gethsemane to arrest him. He asked him, who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he said, I am. And they all fell over backward. <laughs> these strongest and most capable of men among men, these soldiers, fell over backward just at the voice of his power. He's the one that watches over us. He's the one that said to them, if you seek me, you let these go their way. Isn't that a comfort? His eyes like a flame of fire, they see and know everything. It says his eyelids try the sons of men. That's a grave thing, isn't it? And they are a devouring fire to his enemies, but again, to his people, a flame of warmth and light and protection for his sheep. His feet like fine brass, having walked through fine, refined brass. That means it's been through the fire. He walked through the fires of God's law, first of all, and God's wrath against his law. Whereas we, we couldn't do that. Our feet aren't brass. We couldn't walk through that. We couldn't walk according to God's law, nor could we suffer his wrath and fulfill the law and put away sin like he did. Uh, our feet are not refined in that fire and strong. His heart, we would fall and be consumed. But that he had any sin of his own to be consumed in that refining fire. Forget about that. It's not that. It's not that his feet needed to be refined because he had any sin of his own, but listen to this, by taking our sin upon himself. It is purged by his precious blood, and so his feet are pure white. They say super refined brass is white. It's silver white. 
And that's what his feet looked like. Strong to trample his enemies now underfoot, but a shining reminder of what he has borne and accomplished for us. Verse 19, he said again, I know, again, he knows. He says that to these churches, I know. Let's remember that, he knows. Uh, I know thy works and charity and service and faith and thy patience and thy works and the last to be more than the first. Think about this for a minute. Remember when David said in Psalm 139, 23, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. He does. <laughs> That's what he's saying here. He does. He, know, he does do that. He knows our heart and our thoughts too. But if he is our righteousness before God, we need not despair over that. It might seem like a scary thing that he, oh, he knows my every thought. My thoughts are so sinful. He knows my heart. My heart is still, I still have that heart of flesh, black and proud and selfish and evil. But if he's my righteousness before God, listen to the next verse there by David. He said, try me, Lord, search me, know my heart, know my thought. And then he said this, and see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me. Lead me away from that. Lead me out of that. Lead me out of myself. Lead me in the way everlasting. So we want him to cause us to grow in his great. We want to confess our sins before him and say, Lord, oh, help me. And we want, to show, we want him to show us our error that we don't even know and our foolishness and teach us and make us more like him. We don't hide our sin or deny it anymore like Adam in the garden because he's our righteousness. Our sin is something we're ashamed of and we want to do better. We want to be more like him. Neither our failings, our evil, nor our doing better has anything to do with our righteousness before God. We stand in Christ. And so we want to go and sin no more. But even as we sin, and we know we will, we can't, and we can't be in this flesh ever sinless. We can grow in his grace. But we stand in Christ, perfect and spotless in the sight of God. And so we're not afraid to confess our sins before him or to, or to have him show us and teach us and say, go and sin no more. He's our righteousness. When the Lord says here, I know your works, he's talking in this verse about the good things. And we want to be like Tabitha, described in Acts 9.36. Listen to this. It says, now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. And this woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. I want to be like that. I want to be full of good works, but I don't want to trust them. And we're so prone to that. I don't ever, ever want to think that they contribute at all in any way to my righteousness before God. Christ is all of my righteousness and all, all my only righteousness before God. We just want to honor him, though. We want to honor him. Ephesians 2.10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And then he said, I know your love. God knows the heart. We can know love by action. You can know whether somebody loves you or somebody else or not by action. But God knows the heart. God's love is defined by what he did for us, though. It's defined by action. 1 Corinthians 13, it's, it's what it does, what it doesn't do. And ours will be defined by action too. When thinking of good works, always remember this too. When He said, when you've done it to one of the least of me, these, my brethren, you've done it to me. You've brought, you brought me a glass of cold water when I was thirsty. You visited me when I was in prison. You, you gave me something to eat when I was hungry. You visited me when I was sick. I've heard some stories here lately that warmed my heart. Our love for him is because of his love for us. And even our love for him is connected to our love for one another. Remember he said to Simon, do you love me? Think about that. He said, do you love me? Feed my sheep. 
He didn't say, if you love me, do something for me. He is saying that. But how do you do something for him? Feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. He knows our service. He said, I know your service. Service has to do with ministry. That's the word. They're ministering to one another, especially the gospel, but in all things, in, in different needs and things like that. Remember what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 16, 15. I beseech you, brethren, he said, you know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. They addicted themselves to the ministry. And again, that's primarily now the gospel ministry to support and to, to further the ministry of the gospel in this world. What the saints need is to hear from God, to minister to the needs of people. Your primary need is to hear from God. And so we minister in the gospel. But servants of one another in whatever needs we have, Think of all the various areas of service in the ministry of Christ. There are preachers and teachers. There are those who work the nursery. That's a ministry. Cleaning the church. Just making money and giving. That's a ministry. All of these things. Some people just have the ministry of just being an encouragement to people and being thoughtful of, of people and things like that. All these different ways in the ministry. He said, I know your service. And then he said, I know your faith. Faith is also shown. You remember James said, you show me your faith without your works. I'll show you my faith by my works. Faith without works is dead. And so faith is shown. Faith is seen in action. And uh, why does the Lord say again, I know thy works? He says it twice in that one verse. I know thy works again. Well, it has to do with the last line of this verse that the last is greater than the first. He said, I know thy works. He's not just repeating himself here. He knows their works and their works. And he said, the last is greater than the first. That's a good thing. These are commendations now. They had grown in grace. They had increased in, in grace. And an increase in grace and an increase in faith is an increase in works. It's just that simple. More, It manifested itself. The grace of God manifests itself in people through works of faith and true service and love for one another indeed. And there were, there were more of them in the latter than, than at the beginning. And he said, I see that. I see that. May that be true of us. But as in most of these letters now, there's a warning too in verse 20. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which called herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now this is almost certainly not an individual in that church named Jezebel. The Lord called Simon Satan once. Remember that. That doesn't mean that he was the individual we know as Satan. He's calling him Satan because he was, because of what he said, because of what was in his heart at the time. And that's all. That's that's the case here. That this this may have been more than one individual. It doesn't just had to have been one person. It could have been a group of people. It could have been men and women. It doesn't have to be a woman. It's the spirit of Jezebel that we're talking about. It was in this church and it was tolerated, allowed to operate, and allowed to disrupt. And Jezebel, I, we, we, we don't have time to do a, a history or a study of her as a person in the scripture, but she was an evil queen. And if you do this, do study her later, you'll see all of this. This was what characterized her. She worshiped Baal. She hated and pursued Elijah to the death. She tried to kill a, a God's prophet. And she was deceptive and manipulative. She did deceptive things to get her way and to, to fulfill her desires. If you read her story, it's in, uh, I believe, 1 Kings chapter 16 through 21, and, and, and it mentions her in 2 Kings too. But you'll see how she plotted and deceived and manipulated people to get what she wanted for her own gain and her own glory. She undermined, in doing that, she undermined the real authority, the king, with her scheming deception, and she hated the true God and his authority, Elijah. 
That's, ex that's the perfect description of a false preacher. They hate God. They, they worship idols. They're selfish, deceptive, manipulative for the purpose of gain and glory for the flesh. That's what it is, a false preacher. That's who Jezebel represents here. And this is what our Lord's warning is about. All in the church of God must deny self. We don't do what we do for selfish motives. Now, of course, we still have the flesh in us. But that's not what this is about. The Lord's people take up their cross and they live to honor and glorify Christ. There's only one reverend in this church and it ain't me. There, there some churches like that quaint saying, you know, you, you can't spell church without you, but God can. He does. In fact, if there's any ever if there's any somebodies in this church, they like this saying too. Everybody is a church where everybody's somebody. God's church is where everybody's a nobody. And I'll tell you this, not a, furthermore, God says if there's a somebody in your church, don't tolerate them. That's Jezebel. That's somebody out for themselves. That's somebody here to get glory for themselves. That's not a church. That's not worship. It's all about his honor and glory and worship. That's what it means to be a servant of Christ, to do his bidding, to do his will, to want his promotion and glory. Now, I'm not sure how this church tolerated Jezebel. It's not specific about what it, what exactly, how that happened. But I know this, there are a lot of subtle ways to do that. There are a lot of subtle ways to do that. Jezebel here, whether a person or a group, may well have been somebody or a group of people that, that people in the church loved. It might have been somebody's family. It might have been somebody that everybody liked and thought highly of. It very well could have been, and that's why it was so easy to tolerate. But Jezebel cannot be tolerated. We are to leave such for God to deal with. And, and not tolerate them. And that's exactly what God did here. He said, I'm going to deal with her. You're not to tolerate her. I'll deal with her. Verse 21. He said, I gave her space to repent of her fornication and she didn't do it. She repented not. Now listen, God gives warnings and he gives space. And I looked that word up. It just means time. He gave time to repent. God is long suffering with sinners. Look how he dealt with Pharaoh now. How many times did God say to Pharaoh, let my people go before he wiped everybody out in the Red Sea? How many times did Pharaoh thumb his nose at God and say, I, who, who do you think you are? We know that God's purpose all along was to bring Pharaoh down. There's no question about that. But when Pharaoh went to hell, he couldn't blame God for it. He, he, he busted hell wide open. Hell was crying out to swallow him up. What a wretch he was. Remember what God said to Cain in Genesis 4, 6? The Lord said unto Cain, why are you wroth? Now this was, this was after he killed his brother. Of course, he was angry with his brother because God accepted his brother and he killed his brother in anger. But this is after that. This is after God had passed judgment on Cain for doing that. Now he's mad at God. And God said, why are you wroth? Why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? I don't want to put words in God's mouth, but that's kind of like saying, whose fault is this? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. It's your fault. It's your sin. Your sin is your problem, your pride, your rebellion. That's true of every sinner. It's not, it's not God's fault. And then in verse 22, he said, Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. I just want to make one comment about that. If you despise and rebel against God and his Christ, he will destroy you and he will get glory out of it. Just like he said there, I'm going to destroy you. 
I'm going to kill you, her and her children with death, and, and I'm going to torture you before I do it. You're going to go through tribulation. And here's what's going to be the result. All the churches will know that I am he. Everybody's going to know who God is, and it ain't you. So if you rebel against God, he'll wipe you out, and he'll get glory out of it. Verse 24. And we'll kind of cover the rest of this together and just make a brief comment or two. But unto you I say, and unto the rest in Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, this, this false doctrine, in which have not known the depths of Satan. Think about that. What does God call man's religion and man's pride and rebellion? The depths of Satan. As they speak, and they, they, they do speak, don't they? I will put upon you none other burden. Those of you who are not involved in this, and if you're not tolerating this, and, and you won't tolerate it, I'm not going to put any other burden on you than, than what's true already. That, that you're having to deal, one of the burdens that they had was having to deal with these with, with such pressure of false religion and, the, and opposition against the truth and, and the great pressure that was put upon them to, to compromise. That's one of the burdens. He said, if you, if you stand true, though, I won't put any other burden upon you. But that which you, verse 25, but that which you already hold fast, have already, hold fast till I come. Be faithful in trial. They had some burdens and some trials, but he said, you be faithful in that until I come. <laughs> and I'll tell you this, I, I'm, I'm not the only one that's been thinking this lately. I talked to somebody just the other day about this. I've been saying, even so, Lord, come quickly. And we talked about old John on the Isle of Patmos. Can you imagine being banished to an island by yourself and not having any contact with any other human being for who knows how long? I don't know how long. But it wouldn't take long, would it? And you can, you can almost hear that in his plea with God at the end of this book of Revelation. He said, even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And I pray that too. I pray that too. And, and unto him, listen, and he that overcometh and keepeth my works. Now think about that. Not doeth good works, although we do. We're ordained. He's, or, he's before ordained that we should walk in good work. But he said those that keep my works. That's key there. Not trust there, not trust your works but believe on him and his works. Trust what he does, what he did, what he's doing, what he will do. Unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken to shivers even as I received of my father. Now, power over the nations. People talk about how God's going to set us up as prince, like literal governors and princes and kings and rulers over people in the new earth. That's not what this is talking about. Look, we're, we're going to reign with Christ. <laughs> Those that suffer with him, he said, you're going to reign with me. And these were suffering. And he said, look, I'm going to give you power. Right now, they had all this pressure. People had power over them to to exert upon them, to try to force them to compromise. He said, look, I'm in charge and you're, you're going to reign with me. That's what this is. Not as We're not going to reign with Christ as rivals. You can't have two kings in this world. And I don't suppose you can in heaven either. There's one king. We're going to reign with him, not as rivals, but just being one with him and being glad that he's on the throne. <laughs> Verse 28, and I will give him the morning star. <laughs> wow. 
you know now, you know, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, you know what the one thing needful, the one thing most precious in all of God's universe is. What a gift. The morning star. The morning star. That's the, you know, Christ said, I'm the bright and morning star. We know that, don't we? He gave himself for us. And here he said, I'm going to give myself to you. It don't get literally. People use that word wrong sometimes. They say it's something literally and they don't mean it literally. Literally, it don't get better than that. He gave himself for us and he said, I'm going to give myself to you. His presence, his glory. Remember what he said in John 17, Lord, I will that those that you've given me be with me where I am that they may behold my glory. If you have Christ, you have everything. And he said, I'll give you the morning star. And then listen to what he said last here in closing. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. The Spirit speaks the very words of Christ through a man, through John, through a messenger, through the angel of the church. In the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Scripture says, even the Lord hath made both of them. So if you have a hearing ear, he that hath an ear to hear, if we do have one, he gave it to us. He made it and he gave me one of them. Gave me, gave me an ear to hear. And may he give all of us ears to hear what he saith to us. What he saith. If he that hath an ear to hear, hear what I say to you. Oh, he hath the words of eternal life. And he himself is that life. Amen. God bless you.